Even if you're not the biggest fan of math, if you have at least some interest in fiber crafts, then I promise you, you'll find it at least somewhat fascinating how intertwined the history of weaving and mathematics are. Have you ever taken a look at some satin fabric and wondered at how they're able to make that smooth, glossy finish? Well, about a thousand years ago in China, a weave was invented or developed called the satin weave such that no two threads cross over each other that share a diagonal or horizontal or vertical line. There's really, really long floats and that makes the surface of the satin appear very, very smooth. Many hundreds of years later, a question was posed called the eight queens chess problem. If you've ever played chess, then you'll know that when you're playing with the queen, she can move in any direction, vertically, horizontally, or diagonally. So can you find a way to place eight queens on a chessboard such that they won't interfere with each other? The solution to this wasn't published until two years later in 1850, even though this is the exact same basis of the question that was posed for how to make a satin weaving draft. But I hope that this kind of shows how deeply intertwined weaving and mathematical problems are. I have a bit more information like this to tell you about how foundational weaving is to the fundamentals of math, but first let me tell you a little bit about what I'm working on here. A few years back I took a weaving class and I was so inspired by that that I immediately went out and I bought myself yarn to make new tea towels. That was a few years back. I haven't made any of those tea towels and I haven't bought myself any tea towels because I always thought I'm going to make them. I've been putting it off for forever until recently um, I managed to light the substitute hand towels I've been using on fire in a bit of a kitchen accident. So it is time to replace that with some actual tea towels. What I'm currently doing is called dressing my loom and that is basically setting up the warp. Woven fabric is usually made up of the warp and the weft and they are woven together to create the structure of the fabric so when you are dressing your loom or warping your loom you're basically already doing half of the work. Typically when people think of weaving they think about the active part where you're moving the beater and you're creating the fabric but that is really the second half of what you're doing. The first half is setting up the loom. I'm using a table loom. It's an eight shaft Ashford loom. I got this from my weaving teacher when she retired. I was very, very lucky in that and I, I really love it. It's very portable. It can even fold up with a project on it so I can take it different places. It's very useful for me when I don't have a lot of space. I can fold it up because right now I have commandeered our entire dining table. <laughs> we have nowhere to eat. Now, as I'm slaying the reed, I am reminded of the other very foundational mathematics that connects with weaving and it is a very hands-on way to do division. For a really long time, division was very, very tough. Imagine trying to divide 203 by 13 using Roman numerals. That's a little bit difficult. And what I found really interesting about this particular theory, it's not proven, but it, I think if there's a very strong argument made in the book Fabric of Society, which is a book that I continue to recommend to anyone who's willing to listen. It is an absolutely fantastic book. And it talks about mathematical foundations and the books is specifically Euclid's Elements, which was written in 300 BC. And it is a book containing a lot of theorems and postulates and basically it's a mathematical textbook based on derivation. So every theorem that's proposed in that book or written down in that book comes from deriving it or basing it on a previous theorem. So you can follow the theorem at the end from a direct path from a theorem at the beginning. The only problem is you get back to the beginning, the arithmetic, and you think where does that come from? There's no real information on what is the basis of arithmetic, at least not in that book. And by arithmetic and those rules, I mean an even number plus an even number equals an even number, or an even pl number plus an odd number is an odd number. Those rules that we learned pretty early on in many of our math educations. Where does that come from? Who thought of that first? Why was that important to people? And why did they figure things like that out? Well, let me give you an example. Let's pretend I am a weaver in, I don't know, 2000 BC, and I want to make a fabric that is 10 inches wide. I have a pattern that spans across seven threads, and I know that there's going to be 11 threads per inch. So at the end of the day, I'm going to have 110 threads, but my pattern is seven threads wide. 
can my pattern of seven repeats fit onto 110 threads? With our modern day math and calculators, we can quickly do that division, figure out it's not evenly divisible, and move on with our design from there. But what would they have done back then? As a weaver, what you would do is you, could you would take bundles of seven threads at a time, and you would start at the right end of your loom. You would know about how wide your piece is gonna be, so you would start at the right side of where your piece is gonna start, and you're gonna put seven threads on your loom. Then you're gonna to go to the left side of the loom, to the left side of where the your piece is going to be, and you're gonna put seven threads on the left side of the loom. Then you're gonna take your next seven threads, and you're gonna go back to the right-hand side, and put seven threads working towards the inside. So you're gonna go back and forth between the right and left side of your loom, adding more and more repeats of your pattern number of threads until you reach the middle. And with this in particular, you're going to have five of your threads on the middle and you're gonna have a remainder of two threads left over from this last pattern repeat bundle of seven. You're gonna take those last two threads and you're gonna put it on one end of your weaving. And then you know, at the end of the day, you have 112 threads, but it will be divisible by seven. And basically what this is, is describing what's a lot of times called the granddaddy of all algorithms. It's one of the algorithms that's included in Euclid's elements. And it is called the division by subtraction algorithm. It's not, again, 100% proven that this is the basis of these mathematical theorems, but there's a lot more connection between these basic patterns, and it's a lot of it is relations between numbers and weaving and weaving designs. Anyway, can you tell how invigorated this makes me? I mean, it makes so much sense to me and how related the two are. And to me, a lot of times mathematics was very esoteric, and I love seeing things that are a little bit more literally like I can touch it, I can feel it, I'm interacting with it and I see it myself. Like it's very, very tangible to me. All right, I'll finish slaying my read. I need a little bit of concentration because I have to do a little bit of math in my head as I'm doing the slaying. Hey, more math, more threads, more weaving, more fun. Um, but I will see you again really, really soon when all of my threads are in my loom and my warp is set up and so we can see each other again for a little bit more of the weaving. I missed a bit of a crucial step in the setting up of my loom, and that is that I did not count the heddles that I have on each of my shafts. If that those terms don't make sense to you, the heddles are the little strings that you see here that span between these two little middle bars, and I have to feed each thread of the warp through one string, depending on which one I have to thread it through is based on the pattern. So this is basically what makes the pattern in my weaving. And what I should have done before I started threading is double check to make sure that I have enough of these little ones on each one of my shafts to thread all my thread through. I have 400 ends. Um, which means that I should have had a hundred per shaft because I'm using four shafts, not all of my eight. And I am up to like 54 
short on some of them. My next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to count how many of these petals I have on shafts five through eight because I'm not using them for this pattern. Cross my fingers that it's enough and then I have to figure out. I honestly have no idea how I'm going to do this because this is all nailed and screwed together how I can get one of these shafts out in order to take these petals off. managed to fix what was wrong yesterday. I got the right amount of heddles on everything, but I did not continue to thread the heddles last night. It got too late and my brain was too much mush. After my breakfast today, I'm going to go and finish threading all the heddles in the pattern. Then we have to beam the warp and tension it correctly. And then we can start weaving the weft. The setup and the warping part takes time, but if you do it right, you are already halfway there to making a fabric. That's what I always try to keep in mind here. I'm, I'm almost halfway there. <laughs> I just finished threading all the heddles and I'm too short. I should have exactly 25 repeats of my pattern and I am two threads short. I went through all the heddles once and I can't find the error so I'm assuming I made an error when I first was counting out all my warp strings. Ah, <sighs> uh, well, I can, you know what I could do is I could thread through two more threads of the appropriate length. And then that way I can have an exact pattern. I might do that. Okay, so I might grab two more warp threads, thread those through two more threads, and then we're there. <laughs> just finished tying my warp onto my front beam, uh, or at least so I thought. And the next step would be to tension it evenly across, but I was having a problem because every time I was pulling on this to try to get some tension, the back would unwind itself. Like I didn't have anything to pull against. And I was like, what is wrong with my loom? Turns out I wound the back one the wrong way around. So let me see if I can show you this. I wound the front one the right way around. The front one goes like this. Can you see the direction that it's winding? That is correct. And the back one I wound this way. So this should be going in that direction and winding around this way rather than this way. So what I'm going to have to do is wind everything to the front and then rewind it onto the back and then I can do the tension. So ah, <laughs> just the realities of weaving I guess for me. I think it's done. I think I officially did it. The loom is set up. Didn't want to jinx it, but I think it's true. I'm very excited. I've got to go get my settle, sh settle, shuttle set up. Just combining my words now. My brain is so mush. And then we can get down to the weaving. We can start generating some fabric.
Weaving these details has taken me quite some time, not just because weaving in general does take a while and is a pretty intensive process, but also because life has been a little bit hard for me lately. Um, you might have heard in my last video, I have been quite ill. I haven't been that sick in a long, long time and it took me a while to recover. Thankfully, I'm feeling much better, but there's been some other things in my personal life that have been a little bit difficult. So not all of my focus and time has been able to be on my weaving and my other fiber craft but like many times in years past when life has been hard, I turn to fiber crafts as a way to get through the hard times and I know it's difficult now, it will be better and it's just wonderful to be able to work at a project that is peaceful, restful, repetitive and in a way a kind of meditation to help me through and it really kind of turns my mind to some poems about weaving so I hope it's okay if I recite one for you now that I think really kind of reflects on the interlacing of weaving and life. This is I Am Weaving the Tapestry of My Life by Vera Agnes. I am weaving the tapestry of my life. I am spinning the threads of my past, the odd and obli strands, the smooth and soft ones. It is all flowing like silk through my hands once I sit down at my loom. Only when it all blends together, I can see the unfolding pattern I was blind to see before. When bits and pieces seem like bitter blocks, they now turn into manifold ornament to enliven my life on a tapestry of experiences. The more I weave, the more I trust. Though sometimes I will bleed and blister, it is inherent to the weaver's work, and weave I must. My tapestry is unique as yours, not better or worse, simply mine, and as my tapestry grows, so do I. I weave and I weep, I weave and I laugh, I weave in darkness, I weave in light. This weaving never ends. And so with that, while the weaving of my life, I guess, and these experiences aren't over yet, the tea towels are, and I feel like it's a wonderful way for me to work through this. And I have a few other projects that I'm working on right now that are kind of restful and peaceful and really helpful, but it is absolutely beautiful. Like I cannot tell you the satisfaction I get from pulling these tea towels off of the loom and seeing them ready to be completed. So now they're off the loom, they still need to be laundered because that shrinks. Um, my particular cotton linen blend will shrink by about 10% in every direction. And after that is all washed and it comes out of the wash, I need to cut them apart, uh, weave in any of those loose ends that you see and hem them over. And once that is complete, it is ready for the final reveal. And what better way to do a final reveal than by baking a cake using my new tea towels. Thank you. 